Hello everyone, my name is Carrie Nixon and I'm a first year master's student of environmental science and management at the Bren School at UC Santa Barbara. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with UCSB Professor of Industrial Ecology and Pollution Prevention, Roland Geyer. Dr. Geyer studied physics at Technical University Berlin and worked in financial risk management before studying sustainability at both a business school and through his PhD program in engineering. This winding path into the sustainability field informs Roland's work with a variety of different perspectives. Dr. Geyer's research group utilizes material flow analysis, which quantifies how materials move through the economy and life cycle analysis that assesses the potential environmental impacts of products and services from production through disposal. With these approaches, uh, they have advanced the theoretical understanding of reuse and recycling, and they have conducted award winning work in the study of plastic production, use and fate. Today, we're going to discuss some of the major themes that Dr. Geyer explores in his upcoming book, The Business of Less, which is due out in September. Welcome, Dr. Geyer. Thank you for speaking with me today. Thanks so much, Carrie. Uh, it's really exciting to be here. So what inspired you to write The Business of Less? Why is this book needed right now? Well, um, first of all, I'm just getting increasingly worried about the state of the environment and um, things seem to be getting worse, not better, mm -hmm. whether it's biodiversity, whether it's the climate. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, I've been studying uh, the relationship between business and the environment for over 20 years now. And uh, it's been literally almost 30 years since the um, Earth Summit in Rio. And, you know, we're making all these efforts, but things seem to be uh, getting worse rather than better. And so I tried to investigate that in in some depth and uh, basically write onto paper everything I've learned in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain allure to the idea of win-win solutions. Can you talk about why the idea of a win-win approach to greening the economy might actually be a losing proposition for the planet? Yeah, so maybe just to briefly explain, right? The mm -hmm. So the, the win-win paradigm, I would call it, is, you know, one of the, the two big ideas in, I would say, current corporate sustainability together with eco-efficiency. And win-win is the idea that uh, contrary to prior beliefs that um, business and the environment doesn't have to be a dichotomy, mm -hmm. right? So up to, I would say, the Rio summit, it was basically um, environment, the environment and business were like a, a zero sum game, right? It was either the environment wins or business wins. It couldn't, it couldn't be both. And then along came, you know, the famous Porter hypothesis that strict environmental regulation actually, you know, can be good for business. And um, the idea of eco efficiency. And the, the basic idea now is that, the, you know, that, that we can use the profit motive that sort of drives businesses um, uh, to achieve environmental impact reduction. Mm -hmm. And I would say that actually, at, at, you know, after the, the, this has been so persuasive, this idea that um, after a while, I felt like this was basically everyone in corporate sustainability was now using was was basically saying that this was not just one, but maybe the main or even the only way to pursue corporate sustainability. So pursue profit maximization and reduce environmental impact. So do well by doing good. And as, as I just mentioned earlier, you know, things are, you know, with some exceptions, things seem to be still environmentally heading in the wrong direction. So, so why is that? Mm -hmm. And it took me 20 years to finally decide that I, I think win-win is, is the wrong way to try and reconcile business and the environment. Thank you for that introduction to win-win. Would you expand a little bit on this idea of eco-efficiency? 
yeah, I can do that. So the the um, well, and and maybe so. Well, I'll briefly maybe what I didn't do is why why I finally believe that win win is the wrong way, right? There's a chapter in the book that that I actually stole from uh, and another publication saying why win win won't work. Let's mm -hmm. let's not say steal, say I reused it. Okay. <laughs> and and so my two PhD advisors, Tim Jackson and Rolling Cliff, actually. Uh, wrote a, a very short paper that was very influential, had a big impact on me. And they were pointing out that, you know, the profit motive sort of pulls according to them in two different directions, right? The one is the idea of eco-efficiency, right? That you can save money by being more efficient, that you can save money if you use energy more efficiently, if you use materials more efficiently, if you cut down on waste, you know, like all these things would be sort of efficiency improvements and they save you money at the same time, which is great. But then they also observed that the profit motive also propels, motivates companies to sell more year after year, right? So not just be more efficient, but also increase your output. Um, and, and that obviously just increasing output will increase environmental impact. So they sort of say that there's this tension, they call it irreconcilable tension in industrial ecology um, between becoming more efficient, right, reducing environmental impact, but just producing more year after year after year, and right, and, and those things pull in in the wrong direction. Hmm. And um, I've personally come to the conclusion that it's actually even worse than that, because even cost savings come with environmental baggage. Right? If you save cost, that money is now available, right? Either to the shareholder or the customer, right? If the company decides to pass on the cost savings, um, and they will be spent and will create environmental impact again. So the, actually, that is called the indirect rebound effect um, by in the literature. So it just seems very, very difficult to, you know have your cake and eat it as mm -hmm. it as it were and interestingly um this march actually there were a couple of publications that i that came out uh, from business scholars at business schools actually also basically renouncing win-win and saying that we we need to we need to get away from it and this yeah eco efficiency is the notion of you know like an environmental indicator over an economic indicator, right? And maybe the most famous one is the carbon intensity of GDP, right? So how greenhouse gas emissions per dollar GDP. And, and that is sort of my big example in, in chapter one is that, you know, if you just look at greenhouse gas intensity of the global GDP, just at that indicator, eco-efficiency indicator, the news is actually good, right? Because it actually has since Rio, since 92, um, I have to look this up. It has gone from 560 gram per dollar to mm -hmm. 420 grams per dollar, right? So we we are Reduction. wonderful, right? So this mm -hmm. is uh, uh, GDP is less greenhouse gas intensive than it used to be 30 years ago. But if you multiply it with the apps, you know, G we actually double GDP in those 30 years. Right? <laughs> so, so big so, increase. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> 25% decrease in the carbon intensity is nothing mm -hmm. compared to doubling um, global GDP. And that's why the, you know, in absolute terms, which is what really matters, greenhouse gas emissions actually have gone from 22 to 36 billion metric mm -hmm. tons. And that is for me is the, you know, as I call it, the problem with eco-efficiency, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's too narrow, right? The, the eco-efficiency would tell us, oh yeah, carbon intensity mm -hmm. of the global GDP is going down. This is wonderful, right? But if we, if we increase GDP at the same time, then again, you know, it's just not, not really getting us to where we need to be, right? Which is carbon zero now, <laughs> in, you know, right. either 12 or 20 years, depending. Yeah, it's almost uh, a little bit counterintuitive uh, because, as you said, that increase in efficiency, it sounds like, you know, you're saving money, you're reducing emissions, that sound, those sound like really good things, uh, but you lose, that can 
you know, cause you to lose sight of uh, that absolute gain, which right. is where we start to run into trouble, right. uh, especially because, you know, economic growth is is really the primary way that uh, there we've experienced globally an increase in standard of living. And so uh, I'm really curious from the perspective of your re research, what exactly is the role then of business and, you know, growing the economy right. uh, in creating a sustainable future? Yeah, well, that it's this is kind of what really um, was was one of the big ideas behind writing this book is exactly, you know, what is the role of business? um on a planet in peril as i call it because i think that's where we are right now and i'm, I'm not alone in saying this yeah. obviously um and so there is and i actually googled i i basically said role of business and sent a google query and got all <laughs> kinds of interesting and, and and weird definitions one i really liked was uh the role of business is to um provide uh, the goods and services to the people that want or need them or need or want them. Mm -hmm. So it's very, you know, it's like not normative, you know, there's this famous, I don't know if you ever heard of that famous Milton Friedman definition, you know, the sole responsibility is to increase its profits. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that famously in, a, in an essay, in, I think in 1971. And, and that's where this sort of idea comes from, of, you know, what they call uh, the shareholder um, primacy, right? Shareholder value is everything, nothing else matters. And so uh, I, I much prefer this idea, the role of business is to provide the goods and services that people need and want. And then if we're on a planet in peril, then I would say the role of business is to provide for everyone while dramatically reducing environmental impact. Mm. That's... Okay. That's sort of my definition now. So that, I mean, that just begs the question, how, how, how does that do happen? <laughs> how to do it? It's, it's a big lift uh, for sure. And mm -hmm. it doesn't help that I actually now concluded that we kind of went about it the wrong way for the last 30 years, right? Which is what for me now explains the lack of progress, right? So, you know, the first half of the book is basically trying to understand how we got into that pickle that we are. And then, you know, I don't obviously don't want to end there. The second half is trying to sort of say like, well, what, how can we reconcile business in the environment? And I'm trying to sort of do it in a way that's accessible, right? And maybe not just for very environmentally literate MESM students and, and colleagues, but kind of broadly for everyone who's interested. And so I come up with these strategies. And so I call them pollution prevention strategies and um, that that businesses can use, but households can also use. And so I call them um, again, different, less. And then uh, very recently, I, I, I sort of come up, came up with a with a new one. It's sort of the least tested, I would say, and I call it labor, not materials. So they're basically like four tools in the in the business of less uh, toolkit and then there's an you know sort of an assessment method that that i propose to because you cannot manage what you don't measure right you need to actually know whether whether you're really using those strategies in an effective way and so my what i propose is it's it's called net green and it's it's actually fairly simple and straightforward so we have those four strategies and then we have net green to measure our progress and hopefully that'll be useful <laughs> <laughs> well it'll certainly you know add an, a new tool uh for people to use so what i'm really interested in is these categories again different right. less can we talk a little bit more about those absolutely uh, yeah i'd love to um and you know i do I, I i don't want to sound like i invented the wheel because mm -hmm. you know i didn't um and those strategies in a way are sort of you know th those those are well-known approaches i'm just trying to really um 
get rid of all the misconceptions or you know like tailor them to really to to the to the use of environmental impact reduction for businesses so so again is basically reuse and recycling mm -hmm. and of course today we are calling it the circular economy right that's thanks to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation they sort of that was sort of a big successful rebranding of reuse and recycling which was I think was uh, you know not doing too well and thanks to the renewed enthusiasm that uh, Alan MacArthur Foundation and McKinsey brought to it now it's 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 hot again right Very much um, so reuse and recycling and uh, and it certainly has great potential but there are also really pitfalls that we have to avoid so so I'm trying to talk about the potential but then also really um, point out the the pitfalls so that we can finally reuse and recycle in a way that truly reduces environmental impact. Yeah, so uh, would you speak to some of the places yes. where let's, reuse let's, recycling has gone wrong? <laughs> let's, let's talk about it. Um, yeah, so so I'd, I'd say the like the biggest misconception, mm -hmm. honestly, not just in the public, but even like in my field to some extent mm -hmm. is the question of what what is the environmental purpose of reuse recycling mm -hmm. and i've done i've done a lot of work on this so i've actually my phd thesis uh, back in the uk uh, was on reuse and recycling so i've been around the block a few the reuse and recycling block a few times and it turns out and i'm really convinced about that, that the only environmental purpose of reuse and recycling is to avoid um, production of new products and materials. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really about just making sure you're throwing everything in the blue bin, right? Because that's not reuse and recycling. That's literally just throwing something in a different colored bin. But you know, the whole it's, you know, it basically reuse and recycling has to achieve four things, right? We need to be able to collect it. We need to be able to in a, in a, you know, in, in, in good enough, in high enough quantities and good enough quality, we need to be able to reprocess it into like secondary materials, right? In the case of recycling or maybe components and even products, if we are, if we are reusing things, um, there needs to be a market for those secondary materials and products. And then most importantly, on this market, the secondary goods need to outcompete primary goods. So what that means is that if we manage to finally somehow recycle decent amounts of plastic, which you know we don't, right? The US recycling rate is less than 9% now. Um, but if we do find a way um, you know, like the PT bottle is, is like someone in the industry called it the superstar of recycling. Um, it's got a recycling rate of 30%, so not quite sure about 28, I think it's, but it's, that's it's the best, particle. that's, it's better than nine. And, um, but, you know, if you look globally, virgin PET production is still going up. So we're not reducing our reliance on virgin plastic we are just now adding recycled pet to the virgin pet and that's that's just entirely miss you know like there's no environmental benefit we're just we're still on that overshoot trajectory so really the only point of plastic recycling is to decrease virgin plastic production and that's not happening at the moment so that's that's i would say so the biggest issue with um, sort of a, a naive enthusiasm about the circular economy. That's my <laughs> warning to all circular economy enthusiasts. If you know, like, if we don't manage to reduce our virgin material consumption, then then recycling doesn't really do what it what it needs to do. Is there something about the recycling and reuse process that? uh would lend itself to reducing that overall uh demand or is it is that something that has to happen separately uh, well um I, there, there, I mean there 
there are numbers of challenges, right? And it obviously it's different for different materials, right? Metals have it a little bit easier because it's 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 easier to recycle them than plastics. Um, but I mean, overall, um, I think the you know one one challenge is that um, it, you know there's a in the case of plastic there's a virgin plastic industry and then there's a recycled plastic industry and those are different players right so they're pitted against each other so if the virgin plastic industry tells me that oh yeah we are totally committed to recycling i have a hard time believing that because they're not making their money recycling so you know like they're not they have no financial um stake in recycling um, so, so that is one, one of the problems I think is that, you know, like, and, and for example, in, in some other industries is different, right? Where, where maybe they, you know, they can make money both ways. And then I find it easier to believe that they, they would be happy to pivot and say, okay, let's just recycle mm -hmm. rather than make our money using virgin material. And, but yeah, that's, that's one of the issues. And then, I mean, the other one is that, um, uh, reuse and recycling, the, the economics are just really, really challenging. So um, it, it tends to be more labor intensive, the processes, right? Sorting, inspection, mm -hmm. disassembly, you know, everything, all these things, it's, you know, you immediately think like people doing things, right? Where, whereas the primary industries, you know, like the virgin, the, like virgin material production is highly auto automated and, and has huge economies of scale. So uh, the, the economics are currently really stacked against reuse and recycling. Hmm. So then where does uh, the different and less sort of categories come in? Right, different and less. Yeah, we're talking, yeah, exactly. We only covered the first one. So different is just, you know, do something different. So um, some people call it substitution, right? So you're, you're basically um, trying to substitute uh, a substance, a material, or or a whole product that is, you know, has generates a significant environmental concern, and you substitute it with something that doesn't create that environmental concern. So you use something else, um, and um, you know, there's many many examples. Um, Do you have say, a favorite? Sorry. Do you have a favorite example? My favorite example is, well, I, I have a few. Um, so one substitution that became suddenly uh, of real interest um, with the, um, uh, what is it called, renewable fuel legislation in the US, which I think um, uh, was came into effect around 2000. Um, is uh, corn-based corn ethanol, right? So um, uh, there were, between 2000 and 2010, there must have been, I don't know how many hundreds of life cycle assessments, you were mentioning that tool, uh, of corn-based ethanol. Um, because the, the one thing that we can agree on is that it, they are not carbon-free, right? Um, corn-based ethanol, uh, biofuels in general, right? They still have a a carbon footprint the question is you know like what is it exactly mm -hmm. and and i think at this point um you know in the in the scientific community there's there's basically agreement that um the 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 the, the greenhouse gas savings from switching from gasoline to um uh, corn-based ethanol are either very small, or it may even be negative in if you introduce this thing called indirect land use change, which is, um, you know, the fact that if you like, if you even if you use corn from the Midwest, that's always growing has been growing corn, right, your base that corn was spoken for by the feed industry, mostly. So you're taking this away now from the feed industry in order to make um, fuel. Well, the feed industry still needs to feed their livestock, so they need to go somewhere else, right? And that somewhere else might be Brazil or Argentina, and they convert land in order to now grow feed, um, and that has greenhouse gas emissions that were basically caused 
by that switch, by the diversion of corn. So it gets added in the LCAs now to, um, to the carbon footprint of, of corn ethanol. And then suddenly the carbon footprint can actually be higher than gasoline. So, you know, that not, not a solution, a, a, a regrettable substitution, some mm. people would call that. So maybe that's one of my, one okay. of my favorite un, unfortunate examples said they're not you know like the the problem with substitution like the big problem is that typically um you know the the thing you want to use instead is also not impact free right so the in in order to be net green so really have a net environmental benefit the impacts of the substitute need to be much lower than the impacts of of what you're replacing uh, uh it and um, and that can be really difficult. And it's not just that you know you're shifting greenhouse gas emissions around, but it could be that you're shifting from one environmental concern to another environmental concern, right? Another concern of of uh, you know using biomass for materials or fuels is that um, they have really high eutrophication impacts, right? Because of uh, of the high fertilization fertilizer use and then the runoff um, so other materials don't have that so not only may you not really decrease greenhouse gas emissions all that much but now you're suddenly you're increasing eutrophication mm -hmm. um, so there are many you know many ways that um, substitutions can actually just shift impact around rather than truly overall reduce environmental impact which is why i also can't really get excited about um like things like bioplastic as as a solution right um, so yeah so so you know somewhere in the book i say like a green material is a bit of an oxymoron <laughs> all material <laughs> you know like where that's what happens in packaging when i work with packet you know with people that want to green their packaging that the, the gut reflex the knee jerk reaction is always oh we need to find that green material so what's what's that green material and you know i hate to sort of break yeah i'm trying to break it to people gently but yeah you know, you know like paper bioplastic doesn't matter what it is they, they, they all have environmental impact so ideally what you should do is reduce the use of it mm. and that's the strategy less right so rather than trying and recycle it uh, and rather than just switching to something else that might also still have impacts that that are undesirable why not try and just use less altogether it seems like that would slow down the economic engine <laughs> or you know uh, there might be hesitancy about losing quality of life is it possible to you know what does less look like uh, for businesses for people right. yeah that's 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 kind of yeah that's i think is definitely the million dollar question i mean first of all right i'm i'm trying to really you know i convinced myself and i'm trying to convince the reader that you know of those three strategies you know like less clearly has like is the most attractive one, right? It, it sort of has the impact reduction, you know, built in much more so than reuse and recycling and substitution, right? If you if you manage to package your product with 40% less material, there you go, 40% less environmental impact, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's simple, right? If you switch it over to some, you know, biopolymer then you have to do an lca and you know and you'll probably find that it it it's it isn't you know it's not without environmental impact so environmentally speaking less is a bit of a no-brainer but exactly it can also be a bit of a conversation killer right because yeah less less material less product means less revenue i guess right unless you change your business model mm. and that's i think is is a potential way out is that we really we go one step further and we don't just say well you know we're a steel company we make steel and sell steel right so we need we need to green our steel but we're going to sell billions of 
tons of steel every year because that's what we do. That's how we make our money. I think one way out of this conundrum, if, if it's one, is to, to step back and say, well, you know, like maybe there is a way to do things differently, right? And maybe there's a way where we could, um, you know, provide, you know, enable everyone to have their quality of life, but with less material and energy inputs. And that's based, that's the idea of the business of less, right? And the case study I'm, I'm, I'm using in, like in chapter six is, um, you know, car sharing, which, um, um, you know, is, uh, you know, the, the sharing economy, right, is sort of big, became big i'm not sure if it's how big it still is but it's still you know like a couple of years ago and everyone just says oh yeah uh, the sharing economy is green right we all know that and then when i when i ask and say what makes it green exactly they say well it's sharing it's more efficient and, and so in the case of car sharing it turns out what it is green because people drive less when they share, when they use car sharing rather than owning a car. So they they reduce their driving. And that's, so they're basically, you know, and I'm sure they still have good quality of life, but they manage to have a good quality of life with less driving. Mm -hmm. And the car sharing business model facilitates that. So for me, that's a, you know, it's a, a great example of a business of less. You know, you're basically enabling your customer to, provide you know to for the household with you know everything they need and want i guess uh with less uh environmental impact and, yeah, that's uh, a really great example and and i think there's a lot of different sort of sharing economy um examples that might uh similarly expand give people those options without having to necessarily purchase right. and use um as much that's uh, right. I, I hear in the, um, uh, don't mind me interrupting, but I, I'm excited about this. So it, apparently one of the big developments in in the fashion industry or in the apparel industry is actually renting clothes, right? So, you know, like obviously with sort of certain things it was already going on, right? So if, if, you, need a, if you need a tux for a wedding, right? So why buy a tux, right? You don't know when the sec when's the second time you're going to wear it. So you rent the tux. But now apparently that happens sort of more and more that you can just rent a gown or, you know, and, and so that's, that's one way the apparel industry could, could, you know, really reduce its environmental impact, which we know is pretty substantial. And another one, which I find exciting is, you know, like uh, uh, repair and, and uh, models, right? Um, where, Basically, the the company now gets into mending and and repair. You know, and one example, of course, is just down the road from us, right? Is, is Patagonia has has that built built in into its business model now, which I think is another you know, exciting idea, exciting way forward, where you basically say, well, we're an apparel company, but maybe we can make money, re you know, mending clothes and not just making brand new clothes. And, selling them yeah that's that is so exciting i know it, it personally just feels terrible when there is you know uh, something small that goes wrong with a product and i just feel like that's the end and you know have to, know. to chuck it in the bin and that's just it feels like a tragedy so i know that's it would certainly uh, enhance my quality of life uh, on the consumer end to right. be able to repair and keep that thing that I enjoy using Absolutely. and not have to toss it. Um, so that that is certainly really compelling. I'm curious, you mentioned something um, about, uh, you know, using labor, not materials. And I was curious if we could get into that just briefly because it seems like the trajectory that society has really been on for, you know, since the industrial revolution, revolution has been, um, you know, 
better quality of living through science, less labor by right. using machinery and more right. energy and materials. So that, you know, I can't even imagine what starting to switch back towards more label, labor and fewer materials might look like. Would you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the perfect segue, in fact, right? carry because that's one of the reasons why you can't repair mm. the things that break in your house right because it's that's labor right you need to pay someone to to uh, do that and that you, you know like you ever tried to sort of repair a toaster or something right it's just i mean it would probably be four times as expensive as just buying a new toaster and that i think is kind of that's that's what you know that just does not feel right even though that's the a common economy that we have built right and that we live in is so you are of course you're absolutely right right in a way you could say that the the project of the industrial revolution is to actually design labor out of the economy and replace it with machines right and that's basically materials and energy right so we're having those you know, we're having machines doing all of that for us, run by by abundant fossil fuel, right? Currently, and and I think you, we might. Well, my personal view is that we've overdone that substitution project. Kind of, we've oh, we've 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 exceeded the usefulness of this substitution. So I think there are many reasons to consider to actually resubstitute some labor back into the system because you know at the same time if you're too successful with designing labor out of the economy then you know obviously you you you'll get a terrible unemployment problem mm -hmm. and the only way you can address the unemployment problem if you insist on labor productivity you know going up year after year after year is you have to grow the economy that's the only way um, but then, of course, with the growth of the economy comes the growth of environmental impact. So we are stuck in in that. And I think, you know, it's yeah, it's it's sort of a horrible sort of little hamster wheel <laughs> you know, towards <laughs> towards the environmental abyss. I think resubstituting labor could be one of the tools that could help us get get out of that. Um, and yeah, the, the question is, how do we how do we make that happen? Right? I mean, you know, a company like Patagonia, just simply saying, you know, like, we're, we're going to do this now, and maybe we're going to sacrifice some profit, but it's the right thing to do. Um, that's, you know, that's great. And, and, and I, I wish more companies would follow that example. Um, but then, of course, you know, it needs, it requires the households to cooperate and say you know what patagonia this is great i'm going to you know and this repair costs 40 dollars and i could probably buy a new garment somewhere for the same price but i'm going to do this because it's the right thing and also it makes me feel good about owning the things i own right but you know that's i i, I guess we still probably also need some i'd say robust policy intervention to to you know help even the 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 willing you know the coalition of the willing to on on that road so one idea which actually has been discussed since since the earth summit since the early 90s is uh, what they call ecological tax reform and in in a the, the standard there are many kind of versions but so the standard version would say that um that the idea is that you tax the what you want to design out, right? The environmental bad, like a pigu tax in a way. So you tax materials and you tax energy, um, but you make it revenue neutral. So all the money that comes in, um, you give back to labor. So you basically have a, a revenue neutral shift of taxation away from labor. So you, you could reduce the income tax uh, but then get that revenue from, you know, a CO2 tax or a fossil energy tax. Um, and that would really incentivize, right? It would sort of be, a, you know, it could be a powerful way to sort of set these incentives, right? Where now suddenly 
companies say, well, I'd, I'd love to get labor, more labor back in, but, you know, like now it's also, you know, it's easier for me economically uh, because I have that monetary incentive because labor is cheaper and energy is becoming more expensive. So that's sort of one, one way one could go about this. Are there any other sort of things that would need to happen in order to sort of nudge the economy in that net green direction? Um, step one B. I mean, that, well, that sounds like perhaps a step one, or maybe <laughs> a step two. <laughs> I, you know, I would, I, would, I would love, I think one thing that would really help is to change the narrative of, of corporate sustainability and that's kind of what I'm also trying to do you know in the first half where where basically we need to accept that you know the sole focus on eco-efficiency and this idea that everything needs to be a win-win um, that we need to get rid of that mm -hmm. you know where we just say these these are not the right you know uh, guidelines or the the, the the right so we need we need to throw those tools overboard and then you know act, um, use something like you know some i'm not saying those are this this is the only way but something like this net green idea right where basically as a company and and i see some sign of that happening right where as a company you don't just say oh you know we introduce we re reduce the environmental deep carbon intensity of our product by 20 percent but at the same time your company has grown by 50 percent right so where they say oh okay our you know the absolute amount of impact matters and that's what we need to address mm -hmm. so so just just accepting um the you know that the that some of the old narratives were were wrong and misleading and then looking for for ones that really sort of point us in a in a better direction mm -hmm. i i think would would make a difference well i hope that the business of less will help start moving that you know the conversation in that direction that it's be certainly nice? been really interesting uh to talk to you about this and start thinking Thank about you. these topics. I did have one bonus question for you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's a little bit of a curveball, but if you had a, say a magic wand or were, you know, um, king of the world for a day, what Ooh, would like you <laughs> <laughs> your, and you could change, you know, one thing that's going to, to help solve this problem just with the snap of a finger, what would that one thing be? What would your, oh. mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! Uh, feels good to be king. Um, <laughs> one. Well, I, you know what, I um, actually just uh, a little while ago published a, um, an op-ed in the Guardian, um, basically saying that I think at this point what we need to do with fossil fuels um, in order to really become get to net zero is is ban them. Mm -hmm. so, um, I, I, I think we are at that point where something you know, drastic is needed. And I think it can be done actually ban by ban. I mean, you know, a organized phase out, obviously that's kind of how we did it with CFCs, right. Um, in with the Montreal protocol or how we did it with lead, right. We phased out lead from gasoline. And I think we could do it with, um, fossil CO2 if we really wanted to, but if I was King, I would just ban it and that would be it. <laughs> and we would be, would be fossil carbon neutral, just like that. Well, brilliant. Uh, <laughs> thank you. It's been such a pleasure talking with you today. Thank that you. That was fun. Thanks, Carrie. It was fun.